morning, everybody. Happy Sunday. Are you happy? Okay, so it's happy Sunday. All right, so we continue on our sermon series. Thank you, praise and worship team, for leading us. Our sermon series uh, called God's Answers to Tough Questions. I would like to refer all the questions to God and let him answer those tough questions. And today, the question of today is, should we take the Bible literally? Mm. Okay, so let's uh, open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your presence. Your presence is what we need today. And we expect great things to take place in our hearts, inwardly and outwardly in this church. We thank you. We honor you. You are truly welcome. Holy Spirit, come. In Jesus' name, amen. Should we take the Bible literally? So the big idea is where I'm going to base uh, the message today. So just a heads up. Today will be more, you might feel like more teaching than preaching. And if you don't know the difference, good, keep it that way. <laughs> but that's what it's going to, for those who can see and uh, feel the difference, that's what it's going to feel like today. But the base of this message is proper biblical interpretation will clarify the seeming contradictions. You know, those contradictions we feel and see sometimes, those are seeming contradictions found in the Bible. And when we, so proper biblical interpretation will clarify the seeming contradictions found in the Bible and affirm that it is reliable. The Bible is reliable and applicable to our daily lives. That is the base of our message today. So it starts with proper biblical interpretation. So let me start with a quiz. So there are five questions. If you get three out of five, you pass, 60%. If you get two out of five, uh, you get a, uh, still a P, but it pales. <laughs> okay, that's what you get. Okay, here we go. Are you ready? Number one. Which, so, so the question, which of the following are not in the Bible? Number one, confession is good for the soul. Is it in the Bible? Yes or no? Yes, it's in the Bible. Okay, so that's number one. The second one, God helps those who help themselves. Is that in the Bible? Yes or no? Okay, yes. Uh, okay, so we have no here. S okay, how about this one? Spare the rod, spoil the child. Is that in the Bible, yes or no? Okay, that's, that's a lot of yes there, okay. Uh, we'll find out, okay. Uh, how about this one? Do unto others what they have done unto you. No? It's not? Are you sure? Okay, so you say no. Okay, here's the last one. God works in mysterious ways. <laughs> Where do you find that in the Bible? Okay, first of all, let's go one, one by one. Confession is good for the soul. Which one are you referring to? Which verse? First John 1 9, perhaps, may, but that's not how exactly it sounds like. It says, if you confess, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us, right? Of our sins and to cleanse us for, uh, uh, from all unrighteousness. So does that say confession is good for the soul? Is that what it says there? That's not what it says. Maybe we are translating in a different way. Okay, so, but it's not. Literally, it's not in the Bible, okay? I can't find anywhere, I, even if you Google, it says, verse, confession is good for the soul. No, it's not there. Okay, so it's not there. The Bible does not say. How about number two? 
God helps those who help themselves. That's also not in the Bible. Okay? Uh, in fact, uh, it's good if you can't help themselves because if you can't help yourself, that's when you need God. Okay, so that's why it's better not to be able to help yourself. How about this? Spare the rod, spoil the child. It's not in the Bible, yes or no? A lot of people said yes. Oh, you changed to no. <laughs> listen, to, listen to Proverbs 13, 24, okay? See if it sounds like that, okay? Whoever spares the rod hates their children. It's talking about discipline, right? If you don't discipline, that means you don't love your children. But is that, that, does that sound like this? Spare their eyes? That's not what it says. So that's not there either. How about do unto others? Isn't that the golden rule? Do unto others what they have done unto you. No, that's revenge. The golden rule is reverse. Do, <laughs> Do unto others what you would have them done unto you. That's the golden rule. That's what Jesus' words. This one is more like revenge. They have done something to you, do the same thing to them. Okay, the last one. God works in mysterious ways. Uh, it is true that God does that, but it's not actually found in the Bible. L literally, it's not there. So, did anyone get five out of five? Four out of five. Three out of five? Two? One? Oh, you got two. And zero. Okay, so now we're talking. Okay, so should we take the Bible literally? That's the conversation. The question we need to answer. In fact, every major religion, not even major, but minor religion, major relig religions talking about uh, Muslims has, has the Quran and the... Uh, Hindus have the, uh, the Gita or the Bhagavad Gita or Jehovah's Witness. They have the New World Translation, also awake. The Latter-day Saints, they have the Mormon, the Book of Mormon. The Bible, we revere as Christians, believe it's the Word of God and try to live by it. But the question is, number one question, can we trust the Bible? Before we answer the question, should we take the Bible literally? I think it's very important to take about, uh, answer the question. Should we trust or can we trust the Bible? So let's go through what the Bible, uh, the uh, trustworthiness of it. Let's check the scientific accuracy of the Bible. Because the Bible is scientifically accurate about the shape of the earth. You know, scientists, before the 1500s, so 1500s, we're now in 2000, right? 1500s, down below, scientists thought that the earth was flat. Any flat earther in the room? Flat. The earth is flat. Any? Okay, so you're not living in the <laughs> below 1500. Because after 1500, then they realized, wait a minute, the, the earth is not flat. It is, uh, it is round. So, but, okay, so that was in the 1500s, all the way to zero, but 700 years before uh, zero, which is 700 BC, meaning 2,200 years before scientists found out was the word of God in Isaiah 40, 22, where it says, he sits, God sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people, people are like grasshoppers. So 2,200 years before scientists figured out that the earth is round, the Bible already said it and knew it. How about uh, the, uh, in terms of where does the earth sit? So I know from the perspective of the Greek, you know, who holds the, the earth? Do you guys know from the Greek uh, mythology? It's Atlas, right? Uh, they figure it's, the earth must be sitting on a pillars or animals or people and, or Atlas. But uh, 
we, the scientists know it's not, but the Bible already figured that out. Job 26, 7 says, He spreads out the northern skies over empty space. He suspends the earth over nothing. So the earth is not sitting in my hands or atlas. It suspends over nothing, but the Bible knew it before scientists did. And how about this one? God will make the descendants of David as countless as the stars in the sky. Why is that important? Because uh, Ptolemy uh, said exactly, okay, he says there are like 1,056 stars in the universe. That's it. And he was certain that's the number of the stars. But then a guy named Galileo, 1608, he uh, created this telescope and figured out, wait a minute, the stars are actually limitless. And scientists in the last 150 years understood that the universe keeps expanding, creating new stars, and it's not fixed stars. And so that's why the Bible knew it even before science, that the countless as the stars in the sky. And so that's the scientific accuracy. Now let's go into the historical reliability of the scripture. Because uh, a scientist named Michael Sanders, in, he is actually also a, an archaeologist. He found, because in the Bible there's, there are two cities called Sodom and Gomorrah. And a lot of people thought that was a myth. Those two cities did not exist until they found out 15,000 tablets that mentioned Sodom and Gomorrah as real cities that traded goods. And Michael Sanders discovered that the city was covered with sulfur bowls, a sign of fire destruction, which is actually mentioned in Genesis 19, 24, says that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and by raining down sulfur from heaven. So archaeologists, from the historical point of view, noted the reliability of the scripture. But not only that, but from the eyewitnesses also. This is Apostle Peter. He says this, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories. He says, when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So not only from a historical point of view, archaeology, but also eyewitnesses. In fact, if you remember, there was a guy named uh, Simon um, from Cyrene, right? There are so many Simons in, in the Bible. Like they have Simon the sorcerer, for example. They have uh, a lot of Simon. But they, I'm talking about Simon of Cyrene. When Jesus collapsed carrying the cross, the soldiers tell him, pick up the cross of Jesus. So that's the name of the guy, Simon of Cyrene. He was from Libya. Okay, so now it's mentioned that he was the father of Alexander and Rufus. This is in Mark 1521. Why is that is important? Because the early Christian community knew these two people and that they could corroborate the account story of the crucifixion. So not only historical in terms of archaeology, but eyewitnesses. Here's the third. Can we trust the Bible? Let's look at the transmission accuracy. So we believe that the Bible is from God's, the Word of God, transmission from God to man. This is called inspiration. Not perspiration, inspiration. That is the transmission from God to man. Listen to the Apostle Peter, 2 Peter 1.21. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So it is 
The word of God is carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's how it is transmitted from God to man. Inspiration. Now from man to man, it's called copying. Uh, but not copying in your exam, okay? That's a different copying. If you look at the Bible warning in Revelation 22, 18 to 19, it says, do not add or take words away from the scroll of this prophecy. So there is a warning. But let's go outside of the scripture, and we find out that there are, the, old, the New Testament is composed of 5,000 full or partial copies of manuscripts that is 99.9 certainty and none of that 0.01 is related to the basis of doctrine. So just imagine this, okay? So the Greek New Testament, 5,000 full or partial copies and 99.9% accurate. That is from man to man, copying. Just to let you know, there was actually a group of people in the Dead Sea, Dead sea area, that's their job. Copying in case somebody comes, the Romans come and destroy, and they did. They have all these copies everywhere. So that's uh, copying. How about from past to present, from that time to where we are now? That's called collection. Okay, so it's called collection. Now they do a test. It's called canonization. What is a canonization? It's, it simply means it's a measuring stick or measuring rod. And they have three tests to see if the Bible has been from past to present accurate. It's called collection. The first one is, they ask the question, and these are the church fathers, okay, that are meeting. They had multiple meetings in Istanbul. They had meetings. Um, they have all these uh, events there. But the question they ask, did the book come from a prophet or an apostle? So, for example, if uh, the book is written by um, Chris Casimo, it's in the Bible. No, it's, I'm not a prophet. I am not an apostle, so that's not good. But if it's coming from Apostle Peter, then that's the first one. So then that's not enough still, right? So then they go to the next question. If it is from the Apostle Peter, for example, did the book have doctrinal integrity? Did it match the revelation already accepted? Because it could be from Peter, but it was not. You know what I mean? So they have to match the doctrinal integrity that was accepted within the leadership of the church. And then the third question is, did the book have wide acceptance? Did many of God's people in several places validated the writings? So, in other words, do they validate what they have found? So, in other words, the process is robust, ensuring that the Bible is accurate. And so, in our studies in theology and biblical um, historicity and accuracy, I can say that the Bible is trustworthy and it is something that you and I can count as accurate. So now that we have studied that, the next question is, how do we read and understand the scripture? Should we take the Bible literally? Literally. Let me give you this uh, survey, U.S. pastor survey of their view of the Bible. The first one is that the Bible is the actual word of God, and is taken literally word for word. Okay, so 28% say that that is, the, this is the word of God, word for word is the word of God. The Bible is the inspired word of God, but not everything in it should be taken literally. That's 47% of pastors. And this is a bit concerning, the let, let, letter C. Okay, this is concerning. The Bible is an ancient book of fables. Fables are stories with animals, right? Legends, history, and moral 
precepts or laws recorded by man. 21% of the pastors think that way. And their church probably is closed. Now let me define what literally is. Because this is something that can be confusing, right? The Bible is the actual word of God and is to be taken literally word for word. Or the Bible is inspired word of God, but not everything should be taken literally. When we talk about literally, we are talking about the meaning of the word. Literally. When it says that Judas hanged himself, and you find in another book that says, go and do likewise. That's a different, <laughs> that's not literal translation. It's something else. So let me go through from the scripture what we should take literally and not literally. Okay, let me uh, give you an example. Literal, the law, history, gospel, and epistles. Because in the Bible, narratives in the Old Testament, for example, the law, history, gospel, epistles, every book uh, that are in that, including the, God, the book of Acts, okay? So they are pretty straightforward. Like, we can take them literally, including the miracles that happened. When Jesus fed the 5,000, it is 5,000. And when he just fed with few fish and few loaves, it is accurate. The epistles uh, are let letters, okay? From Paul, for example, to the churches. You can take them literally also. And this is some of the things that we need to take literally. The law in the Old Testament, history, gospel, uh, the, the four gospels, and epistles. Now, there are things that you should or I should not take literally. For example, there are parts, okay, not all, of wisdom literature, poetry, and prophecy. Because w wisdom literature, for example, some are found in Psalms and Proverbs. So not all, okay, I, I'm just saying some of the things we should not take literally. Like, for example, let me give you an example to clarify. Psalm 50, verse 10, it says, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Literal or not? God is not a rancher. So no, that's not literal. But what it's trying to say to us is the picture of God's ownership of all of creation. But God is not a rancher. So that's one of the things we learn from Psalms and the Proverbs, for example. There are pictures, symbolic language, but it's still truthful in our lives when we apply that. And prophetic writings, you know, you go into Revelation or the book of Daniel, they have also uh, some pictures, verbal pictures, and imagination. So these things are figurative uh, in language. So not literal. Also, within the Gospels, for example, there are metaphors and parables. Let me explain what, uh, what I mean by that. Metaphors, for example, Jesus says to himself, I am the light of the world, the Lamb of God. The true vine, the good shepherd, the living water, the way, and the door. That's metaphor. These are metaphors. And God, when, he's, when Jesus says, I am the true vine, he's not claiming to be a plant. He is recalling in the Old Testament a metaphor of God's vineyard, his people. And so people misunderstand Jesus because a lot of people take everything, lit literally, even the metaphors and the parables. Jesus, for example, says to Nicodemus, okay, you must be born again. And so if you take that literally, which Nicodemus said, what do you mean, Jesus? Did I go back into my mother's womb? <laughs> I can't. I'm already an adult. Uh, so you don't take that literally, okay? So... So Jesus spoke in parables. Parables are stories in the everyday life to teach lessons of faith and God's kingdom. So a lot of them are not to be taken literally, but Jesus is telling stories to teach lessons of faith 
and God's kingdom. So let me give you uh, the, uh, the genre of biblical literature. I don't know if you can see this. If you can't, uh, you should uh, get your own uh, eyeglasses. <laughs> but you can see here the law, history, wisdom and poetry, prophecy, gospel, letters. So even in here, so we take literally, except when it's like metaphors and parables. Like, you know, when Jesus says, I am the lamb of God, you know, there is some deeper meaning to that. He is, he says he is the lamb, but he says he's also the lion. And he says that Jesus, oh, there's so many contradictions, right? Sometimes I'm confused, all these contradictions. Because Jesus says, I am the shepherd, and at the same time, he is the lamb. How can he be a shepherd of himself if he is a lamb? Or sometimes Jesus says, I am the priest, and I am the sacrifice. Isn't that like a contradiction? Or sometimes Jesus says, I am the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. So when you understand that these are meaning something deeper, uh, you don't take literally when Jesus says, that I am the shepherd, good shepherd. He's referring to himself as God who can take care of our needs. So he is not in a shepherding business. So let me tell you, so metaphors and parables here. These are literal. These are like letters or epistles. Literal here, literal here. And you got to pick some from here that, are not literal, like word pictures, uh, prophecy. So revelation is over here. So there are ways you do to understand some literal and some are not. So here is the consequence, one of the ex consequence in the Protestant Reformation, because one time there was a discussion between uh, the Roman Catholic and the Protestant. The Roman Catholic would say that when Jesus says, this is my body broken for you, that's literally Jesus' body. This is my blood poured out. The Catholic would say, that's actually the real blood of Jesus. By the way, that's called the doctrine of transubstantiation, meaning the substance of the body of the bread changes to the body of Jesus. And the blood becomes real blood from the cup. So, okay, so then the Protestants say, wait a minute, that's not true. That is not the actual body and the blood, or the, uh, yeah, the blood and body of Jesus. It is a symbol Jesus is saying. So then because of that, believe it or not, just from the literal translation or not, the consequence, they had much blood spilled because of that. So there is a consequence for us taking the Bible uh, literally or not. When, so you know the meaning of the word literal now, right? It doesn't mean it doesn't apply to me. When the Bible says, when I believe that Jesus say, this is my body, remember me. I, I do remember Jesus, that he died for me. He shed his blood. So, But it's not the actual blood and body of Christ. So that's the consequence uh, when we misunderstand the Bible. Here's, uh, as a segue to this, what can the Bible do for us? The Bible changes my character, our character. Listen to a uh, psalm. Let's see if you take this literally or not, okay? <laughs> Listen to this. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect. Literal, right? Yes. Refreshing the soul. The statues of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. Literal. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. Literal. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. What is that trying to say? That the word of God 
is actually going to change me. It is going to make the wise the simple, and it's going to make me see correct the wrong things in my life. It enlightens my eyes. So, in other words, the word of God, every word of God, whether it is parables, whether it is metaphors or anything, has the power to change every word of God in this, in this book. How do I know? Let me give you an example. Because not only our character, but it also changes our conduct. Listen to uh, 2 Timothy. All scripture, remember, all scripture, okay? So word for word, all scripture is God-breathed and is use, useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It changes our conduct. I was reading uh, an MIT professor. Uh, I mean, MIT is a really good, uh, good university, but his name was Rosaline Picard, okay? So as a teenager, she said she was a very proud atheist. She thought the Bible would be full of fantastical, I quote, fantastical crazy stuff. But she was surprised. She said, and I quote, I started reading the Bible, and it started to change me. So the word of God, the Bible says, is living and active. It is even sharper than any double-edged sword. That's what the Bible says. It does change. So as we close uh, reflections and applications, we need to uh, study the word of God. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let me explain to you how the meaning of the word richly is. Okay, so... It's like any tea drinker in the house. Tea drinker. <laughs> yeah, you got lots of uh, tea drinker. I know some of you are coffee drinkers. Shame on us. <laughs> but uh, tea is actually good. Okay, so do you know how to steep a tea? Like steep a tea. The process, okay, relates to this is when you leave a tea bag or leaves in the water longer and it allows the water more time to get into the tea and the tea into the water. That's called the steeping process. Steeping process. Okay, so similarly in the Word of God, the more we stay in the Word of God, the more the Word of God stays in us. And so that's why we do need to read and study the Word of God. It's very important to get stronger. So the longer we are in the Word, the stronger we become. Here's the uh, last. Do what, do what it says. <coughs> Excuse me. Do not merely listen. Can you please read this for me? Please. <laughs> Ready? Go. Man, thank you. Thank you, Lord. I recovered quickly. Do what it says. Okay, so our daily Christian habit then is studying the word and doing what it says. That's our daily Christian habit. So let me, in conclusion, let me say this, that the power and authority of the Bible supersede all superstitious beliefs and religious traditions. Depends on your religion, the Bible may not have the power and authority over religious beliefs and, and religious traditions, but because this is the Word of God, what is in the Word of God supersedes our beliefs, superstitious, or religious traditions. Whether it is coming from anyone, really, from any superstitious beliefs or tradition from pastors, priests, popes, presidents, 
I don't care who they are. It is not the power and authority the word of God is. In fact, as I close, let me say this, that our superstitious beliefs and tradition can enslave us, even if they're not in the Bible. Let me give you an example. The word, take the belief, uh, sukob. You know what sukob is? It's spelled S-U-K-O-B. Sukob. What is sukob? Sukob in Tagalog means it's like sharing cover together. So here's what happened. Filipina brides love to follow this wedding superstition. So remember, it's a superstitious belief. It is believed to be bad luck to be wedded in the same year as your sibling. It's bad luck. Or to be wedded in the same year when a family member dies. Because it creates or it covers, envelopes you with misfortune. So now the practical implications of that, we have people in this church. Pastor, I cannot marry. My parents said I have to wait for my sister to get married. And da, da, da. What do I do? It's been five years. What if my sister never did? <laughs> my older sister has to marry first. With so many siblings, with so many uh, family members, when is <laughs> our turn to get married? You know how Sukob can enslave families. But is Sukob in the Bible? It is nowhere in the Bible. So the truth of the Bible, the truth of Jesus, truly will set you free. It, it does. And this is the word of God. Let's pray. Let's call our worship team. Let's uh, close our eyes and just reflect on one question. Where is God speaking to you today? There is truly freedom in the name of Jesus. From all superstitious beliefs, from all religious traditions, because the Bible says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you that you have given us every word of the scripture as authoritative. Whether we translate them literally or not, all of scripture is God-breathed. And it is useful for teaching us, for training us, rebuking us, correcting us. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We allow your word to do that in our daily lives. In Christ's name, amen. Let's all rise as we continue to worship.